Welcome to, to our church and to our talk today. Um, as you know, our catechism series is ongoing. 16 talks with 10 going on in this, um, this year, and then another 6 in, the, uh, in Lent and just prior to Lent next year. So today we've come up to the nature, value, and purpose of the human person, which is a brand new talk <coughs> for this series. As you know, this series has been expanded for <coughs> previous years. Uh, so it's, it's important that we discuss where humanity fits into salvation as well. Uh, and we will talk about salvation in a month's time. And we're going to be talking about that with, uh, that talk's going to be led by the reader at our church and the lecturer in patristics at our, at our um, theological institute. Um, and we're, I'm greatly looking forward to hearing what he has to say about salvation, about atonement, and about a, our concept <coughs> called theosis, which we're going to touch a little bit today. And he's going to be able to draw on a lot more in four weeks' time. So in two weeks' time is school holiday, so you know, we'll take that, that Sunday off too for this talk. Um, and then two weeks after that, again, uh, will be our return to God. That is how it is that humans are saved in every sense of how humans are saved. So this session is designed to teach our anthropology. So what's the nature of a human? Why it is that we exist? And what is our relationship to God? So if you're looking for the Orthodox Christian answer on what is the meaning of life, hopefully we'll give that answer in this session. And we'll be looking at these kind of questions. So, how humans were created, um, what humans were created in, we were created in the something of God, um, what were we created for, what's the reason for us to exist, um, what does creation teach us about genders, what did humans do to all creation in, a, in that huge um, cosmos changing event. Uh, is humanity unique in creation? How does the life in Christ, the fullness of the life in Christ, change our relationship with God? How is the soul created? What does it mean to be human? What's the purpose of a human life? And what does theosis mean? A really brief, basic understanding of what does theosis mean. So just a, a quick, if I can get you to show by fingers, uh, how confident you are. So if you reckon you've got, you can you can probably answer most or all of those questions, just raise five. Uh, if you barely can answer one or two, you know, one. And if you're somewhere in between three, two, four, how confident do you feel already with the questions that are being done? Everyone hold, hold your... So a bit of variety, and it looks like everyone's going to learn something in this session, which is just what we're looking for. Excuse me. You get the one with the extra cushions, it's great. <laughs> so, as always, it's a catechism course and we're teaching about what is orthodoxy. Um, if you're looking for arguments, you know, there's, there's the entirety of the internet where you can get arguments. Trust me, I've seen them and they're awful. Um, but here we've got a catechism course, so uh, that means what is orthodoxy? We're going to be explaining that. Um, and the question time will be at the conclusion of the session. So, to talk about where humans fit in to the general scheme of things, we need to take this all the way back to Genesis. Because Genesis has the answer to why do we exist. So Genesis 1 and 2 is all about everything, how everything was created. Our place in the cosmos we can probably find best summarized in Genesis uh, in chapter 1. So God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over, and I've abbreviated this, but basically every animal. So God created man in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, so have kids. Uh, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the world. I'll just, um, a small tangent, there's two accounts of creation, one longer, one shorter. Um, one of them says have dominion over, the other one says be stewards over. The, um, me looking at that and going, if they're both true, and we should assume that they are, then our dominion looks an awful lot like stewardship. And vice versa. And God said, Behold, I have given you 
all the vegetation, which are food for you, and likewise to all the living creatures. So when it is that we ask, why is it that we don't eat meat when we're fasting, we can come back to here, I've given you plants and seeds, which are food for you. So we're going back to a pre-fall humanity. At the same time, we acknowledge that you know, it's, it's not feasible and practical to do this 100% of the time. But the concession that we make, our tithe of the year that we offer, uh, that's where our fasting understanding comes from. And likewise, he said to all the living creatures, plants and seeds, which are food for you. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So day number six, all of this happened. That's... So, what were we created for? <clears throat> to look after the earth. Yeah. To eat yeah. plants and seeds. Yeah. Yeah. To reflect the image of God. Yes. All of those are true. Yes. So that we can live forever after and have a future life. Yes. Um, I can't get that from, from here, but it is true. Um, but how are we supposed to be in front of God? We're, we're supposed to look after the earth that he created. We're supposed to be stewards. We're supposed, we have that control because we're, we're humans and we were created to as the children of God. That doesn't mean that we can pillage the earth for what we want. We're meant to be stewards of the earth. And that means if we're stewards of the earth, then we're looking after it. And we're not just looking after it for ourselves. Stewards aren't owners. God is the owner. We are the stewards. We look after it for God in the name of God. So if God blessed the earth and called it good, then how should we be stewards of the earth? <clears throat> carefully. Let's start with carefully. Um, and we should be making sure that the earth continues and that the earth is well looked after. I understand that that will look different. Um, maybe different people will have different understandings of how that looks, that the earth will look better. But let's at least start with our motivation, that the earth should look, um, should be taken care of. Does that make sense? Awesome. And we were created in the image of God. Do you notice that we weren't created in his likeness? And this is where what you were saying comes in. Um, that, we're, that we're meant to be with God forever. We're meant, we were created in the image of God. So we had, had that look. We had um, our free will and things along those lines. But we didn't have that similarity, that likeness with God. When Peter talks about, be ye holy for I am holy... What we're talking about is growing into the likeness of God. So we're growing to be Christ-like, to be more like Him. So, um, so that's the significance of saying, so God created man in the image of God, but not in the likeness. We've, we've got some way to go to be what God created us to be. Make sense so far? Verification. Yes. Yes, um, we will talk about theosis a bit later on, but that's that's what we're going towards. That's what we're going towards. And I've got too much on this screen, don't I? I'll read it. I'll read it out. So, humanity's creation in particular. Genesis 2.5. In Genesis 2.5, there was not a man to till the earth. Uh, just after that, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Remember how I said that there were kind of two creation narratives that happened, um, that both happened, but one is described after the other one? Here it is, the second one. Uh, and it does give us some other details. So God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And that's why, by the way, we're buried, we're not cremated. Because we're returned to where we came from. Because, as Paul says, our body is not our own. We uh, return to the God who liberated us from our captivity to sin, uh, and we're returned to the dust from which we were created. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. And then a few verses later, the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to look after him. Very similar to what we were saying before, wasn't it? that we're called to be stewards of creation, that we're called to look after creation. So our attitude to the environment does have uh, moral value. 
it can be good and it can be bad. The, uh, the environment isn't morally neutral. So, uh, God gave a command, eat from whatever tree you like, except that one. Interesting that the first command was a fast, that we were meant to control ourselves. It doesn't give a reason why not to eat that tree, or from that tree. It just says, don't. Can we obey? Because when Abraham, later on, was told, you're going to bear a child, he didn't say, but I'm a hundred. <laughs> he didn't say, but my wife is a hundred. What you're asking is biologically impossible. Are you aware of this? You would think that the answer would be yes, since he created biology. But anyway, <laughs> that's... Um, Adam and Eve did take him at face value, at least at first. Because there's no record of a question, why can't we eat that tree? It was just, okay, you know what's best. We'll run with that. And... Um, so eat of any tree except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You will not eat of it for it. For if you do, you will die. And Paul later will tell us that the wages of sin, the consequence of sin, is death. And so um, death came into the world with sin. That was the wages. Um, where was I up to? And he also said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to hit this up later with some very uh, significant words, but the, the fact of being people means that we need other people. That Ubuntu thing that, um, that apparently is a proverb in Africa, but uh, I haven't seen it written down anywhere, so I'll, I'll just have to take the internet's word for it. But the idea that where we need community and where people, because we're in a relationship with other people, very significant. And Genesis backs this up. So, um, so if God said, I will make him a companion. And so he formed every creature and God named every creature. Uh, sorry, Adam named every creature. And that was good, but none of them were a companion. What this tells us, by the way, is that humanity is unique. There is a moral value to how we treat the environment, but humanity is distinct from this. It's, it's something else. And, and God, so Adam named them, a companion wasn't found, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and God took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh, and the rib... It, through the rib he made the first woman. He made Eve. <coughs> and Adam said, This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. This was quoted by Jesus later on. Jesus being the new Adam. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Very quick marriage, the man and his wife. Um, but that, that was, she was created as companion for, uh, for Adam. I've already drawn this out, but it probably doesn't hurt to draw it out again. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he that created he them. Male and female created he that. We receive the image and we grow into the likeness of God. That takes time. So the fathers will look at Adam and Eve, particularly around the time of the fall, which is what we're going to be uh, moving on to in just a couple of minutes. They looked at Adam and Eve and said they were the equivalent of teenagers. Also remembering that at this time, 12 or 13 was considered the age of adulthood. That's why it is that 12, 13 year olds are able to be godparents. Because they're adults, they're able to take on that moral responsibility. And, um, and so calling them teenagers was calling them very inexperienced adults. What do teenagers do? Well, sometimes they make mistakes. Despite doing the best that they can, sometimes they make mistakes. 
and that's okay. That's that's kind of what we what we come to know and uh, and to expect, and that's all right. We would expect more from people who had more experience being adults, who had more experience doing the right thing and having their actions line up with their intentions. So with Adam and Eve. They could have simply fallen and said sorry. But, and um, the analogy holds, what happens? They try and cover it up. Anyway, I'll get to that later. Um, but this, that was around the standpoint where they were when God created Adam and Eve. It's also worth mentioning here that um, that. No, nothing was a suitable companion for Adam, only a complementary human. And here, here it is that we're taught of two genders. And we don't have the gender versus sex um, delineation for, um, for us. What has been revealed to us is that the two are the same thing. That there are, is male and female. Uh, and we believe this because we were taught it. It was revealed to us both in Genesis and also, it was reaffirmed um, by Jesus in Matthew 19 and Mark 10. So that's why we do hold to that. Now, how does the fall affect us? Genesis 3 talks about a thing that we've come to call the fall. And it sounds a little ominous, having said it this many times in such a short period of time. Uh, what was the fall? And once again, I put too much on the one screen, and I'm sorry about that. But Genesis 3. So the serpent was the most cunning creature and said to the woman, Did God say, don't eat of every tree of the garden? No, we can eat of the tree, says the woman, except the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Can't touch it because God said we'd die. And the serpent said, you won't die. God knows that, it, that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God's. And uh, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and looked good, gave wisdom. So she ate it and gave it to her husband to eat. And their eyes were opened. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to cover up their nakedness. They heard God walking in the garden and hid from him. Strikes me as bizarre. But anyway, uh, what's the natural response when... Um, when you know that you've done something wrong by someone. Shame. Shame. And hiding is an expression of that shame, which is exactly what they did. They were ashamed of what they had done because they did the wrong thing. What's the appropriate thing to do next? You get caught. So what could you at least do then? Confess. Yeah. That's forgiveness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Try to do better next time. Tell them that you're trying to do better next time. And so what happened instead? Um, God said to Adam, where are you? And he said, oh, I heard your voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, wait a second. He told you you were naked. <laughs> Who said? And, um, and so I hid myself. And, um, and God said, did you eat from the tree? Because that's probably what happened. Did you do that? And um, the man said, uh, it was her fault. I'm <laughs> someone else. <laughs> Starting a long and lengthy tradition. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. <coughs> it doesn't stop there. Maybe the rough draft wasn't so good, but maybe the final copy would be better. And God says to the woman, so, what up? And she says, the snake you made made me do it. Alright, cool. We've... But Adam, We're done. The Adam... serpent tricked me into doing it. Um, and so God, God didn't ask the serpent. Notice how humanity is different from animals. Even here we've preserved that distinction. So, um, where was it? God said to the serpent that he was cursed to crawl and to eat dust, which interestingly is how snakes get around. They crawl, and yes, they eat dust. Um, and he said something very significant. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your heel 
and you, sorry, it shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. We're going to get back to that later. That's a very important prophecy there. And to the woman he said, um, I'll multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow you'll bring forth children, and your desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. To Adam he said, because you did this, the ground is cursed because of you. In sorrow you will eat of it all the days of your life. The ground will give poor plants, which shall be eaten. And today we, we would consider some crops to be bumper crops, but apparently this was nothing on what the Garden of Eden had. Good crops or bad crops, they had exceptional crops, clearly, from what we're, what we're seeing here. And, and this is when, um, oh sorry, in the sweat of your face will you eat bread? till you return to the ground, because that's where you came from, and that's where you'll return to. Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living things. God then made clothes and said, The man has be become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So to prevent man from eating of the tree of life, God threw them out of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken, and he drove out the man and guarded Eden with cherubim to preserve the tree of life. Which sounds pretty intense. Whenever angels are mentioned in scripture, and whenever a person encounters an angel, it's generally deemed to be terrifying. The first thing that they say every time is, don't be afraid. That tells us that they were frightening. So, people saying to their loved ones, you're my angel. <laughs> a bit awkward. <laughs> um... Now, it's meant in the most loving way, of course. Um, I just forgot where I was going there. Angels are terrifying. And we know, because it's been revealed, that there's various ranks of angels. Angels are, in fact, the name given to the lowest of ranks of angels. Then you've got archangels and so on. Up the top is seraphim and then cherubim. So you want to multiply that several thousand times, and you can imagine how terrifying it would be to go back to Eden, with cherubim guarding it. Later on, Paul would talk about this in Romans 5, where looking at in our parish Bible study, not Romans 5 specifically, but Romans. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, and this one man is Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in, in life by one, who is Jesus Christ. He's talking about a one person can cause incredible consequences. One person can bring sin into all creation. One person can remove that. One person can fix that problem. Therefore, he continues... As by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So once again, where Adam brings condemnation, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, brings life, brings justification. He continues, For as by one man, Adam, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, so after the fall, after Abraham, was then the Mosaic law. And they're all, they all kind of bundled together. Because of the fall, after Abraham's faith, you then had Mosaic law. The law entered, so that offense may abound. Because before the law, how many rules were there? Well, there was one. Yeah, there was one in, in the Garden of Eden. Don't well, eat the tree. The, the mm -hmm. fruit on the tree. That's right. <coughs> Later on, Noah was given particular rules. Abraham was given particular rules. Not in order. Um, Abraham first, then Noah. And then Moses came and gave, uh, they counted it's over 600 rules. Over 600 uh, laws in the Mosaic law. So whenever you hear the law in scripture, it's talking about the Mosaic law. So the, the law entered so that offense might abound, so that people would be able to see sin, to see how things were wrong and how many things were wrong. If you don't have a law, then you don't know what, that what you're doing is wrong. If you don't have 
let's take a, a common example for us. If you don't have uh, speed limit signs, then you don't know that it's hazardous to drive at 200. Or you might, but, it, but you may not. You might be one of the ones who finds out personally that going at 200 um, down a quiet street is a really bad idea. And then you don't learn. If you have the law, you know that it's wrong before you do it. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So sin was compounded in the world, then Christ came. So as that as sin has reigned to death, so grace might reign, might conquer, might be uh, the kings and rule over, might rule through righteousness to eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have the fall, and we have the resurrection. And these, these kind of oppose each other. Needless to say, the resurrection triumphs. It doesn't bring, it, bring us back to Eden. It makes much more than that. Because it means that it's possible now to, to unite with God. This brings us to something called ancestral sin. You might have heard of the concept of original sin. And original sin is, it's technically we can use the same word, but it's a little confusing, and that's why I've used the word ancestral sin. Some people will use primal sin. Original sin has it that Adam sinned, and therefore we're all guilty of that, that it gets passed on to, to each of us. For us, it's different. We know that Adam sinned and Eve sinned, and they're responsible for their sin. And you know, it's okay to say that, we're all responsible for our own sin. What happens when the, uh, the wages of sin is death is we're not being paid back for the sin that Adam and Eve did. We're experiencing the consequences of what Adam and Eve did. The consequences, it's a, it's a little like um, if you get punched by someone, and say in the arm, you get a bruise. Not because it was your fault, but that's the consequence. That's the consequence of the action. The consequence of Adam and Eve's action is that we live in a world where death is a reality. And if we look around, where brokenness is a reality. The rest of humanity are responsible for our own sins. So we're not responsible for Adam and Eve's sin. We endure what happened because of Adam and Eve's sin. Does that make sense? Lots of nods, that's, that's what I'm wanting to see. Not a lot of nods over here. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's good. Now, what happens? What happens to reverse the fall? <laughs> Remember that prophecy I told you about that was very important. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now that's very strange right there. A rudimentary knowledge of biology tells us that the man has seed, not the woman. And it shall bruise your head. Now a bruise on the head is death, to kill it. Whereas to bite the heel, you can recover from that. You can get antivenom. And it'll be awful and it'll sting, but you'll recover. To be, for one's head to be taken out, well, you know, how big is a snake's head? Right, a couple of inches maybe. Um, so what we're seeing is that the one who was conceived without a man's involvement is Jesus Christ. The one who was conceived without a man's involvement, the devil will bruise his heel. So Jesus, in turn, was put up on a cross and left to die as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. That surely counts as a heel that's bruised. He not only died, but rose. Whereas the one, the one who was born of a woman, will bruise the head of the snake. And so what we have there is a prophecy all the way from Genesis about how humanity will be brought back to God. So we weren't left ostracized. We weren't left as being opposed to God. We always had a hope. We had the hope that we would be 
uh, reconciled to God. It took a few thousand years, but we did make it there. So, the impact of the resurrection on the human person. Who did we become when we were saved? To whom do we belong to? If you read scriptures carefully, to whom we belong is to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, that each of us were bought with a price. That each of us were, much like we, as before we were slaves to sin, we were property of sin, property of death. And we had to be bought. So we were bought with a price, which was the crucifixion, <coughs> which was everything that Jesus endured for, for us from conception to, and the resurrection and then the ascension. We were bought with a price, and that's why it is that we, with all of ourselves, attempt to glorify God. With all of our body, our mind, our spirit, we glorify God. Just a chapter later, Paul says, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Because we were liberated. We're still the Lord's free man, but we are the Lord's. We're not property of death, of sin, of this world. Likewise, also, he that is called, being free, is the servant of Christ. So, we should not, therefore, be servants of men. At the time, of course, slavery was a real thing. And it was something that, um, that we really couldn't do much about. But, we ought not to, not to aim for this. We should be the servants of God. That's where we, we ought to be. Death in the light of the resurrection. I guess I could summarize this with a, um, it was a sermon I heard at the funeral of a friend where he um, knew that death was coming and he prepared for it. And, the, and he was probably as ready as one could be. I guess he'd made confession and, and uh, had communion and he was waiting for it to happen. And and where that was, what that showed, was that there was no power of death. Death was an inevitability. It's how we pass from this life to eternal life, in whatever way that that becomes. What that sermon was, was that death had no power. It was inevitable, like taxes. But there was no power here. It was just a passage. A, a fine, perhaps, to, to greener pastures. So Paul talks about this <coughs> in 1 Corinthians 15. The first man, Adam, is of the earth. And the second man, Christ, is the Lord from heaven. He did this compare and contrast a lot between Adam and Christ, between the old Adam and the new Adam. Those of Adam are of the earth. Those of Christ, which we become by baptism, are, for, are of heaven. So as we have borne the image of the earthly before baptism, we also bear the image of the heavenly after baptism. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption doesn't inherit incorruption, just in the same way. So we need to be profoundly different. We need that rebirth. Behold, he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. For the trumpet shall sound, and the, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You can see all of these, all of these being, we need to be different. We ought to be different from what came beforehand. Baptism is a complete change of life, a cutting off of what we would sometimes call the old man, striving for the kingdom of heaven. You know, in orthodox iconography, how the devil is portrayed? Old man, old man. Old man, decrepit man. Because of this, the old man of sin, which Paul talks about in, in the epistles. Um, and Paul is making the, the comparison between the two. What was before and what is now. What was before you were Christians, and Corinth was a center of licentiousness. All the stereotypes that you hear about Las Vegas or the Gold Coast, 
All the stereotypes were true in Corinth. And they were trying to be profoundly different. So they had that stark contrast. What was it like to be of the world? And what's it like to follow Christ? Very, very different things. The early catechisms would talk about this as well, that there were two paths. That there was the path um, that was worldly and would lead to death, and there was the path of joy that would lead to heaven. It would be hard, but it would lead to heaven. So when this happens, Paul continues, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And here's that famous quote, famous for us anyway, from St. John Chrysostom at the Paschal Homily, the sermon at Easter. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? That's what the sermon was talking about, that there was no victory for death here. It just happened. The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which gives us victory over sin and over death through Jesus Christ. So we've mentioned this a couple of times, where Christ is the new Adam, who is restoring humanity to the way that it should be. Like we got a DNA infusion that took away what um, the, the problems that had come in, the problems that had come in through the fall, and restored this to how we were supposed to be, and also gave us possibility for, for eternity. We are to be, we can be Christ-like. That is, by saying that, that we can be restored to our original humanity. And what, we are, what we're fed by society is that humans sin. And this is part of the human condition. That we talk about being only human. When really this is a lie. We can be much more. We can be much more than only anything. By being human, we're being the children of God. This is an incredible thing that we're called to. Incredible and amazing and beyond us. We talk about being, I'm only human, I'm not a saint. But to be truly human is to be a saint, is to be holy. After all, the word for holy in the New Testament, in the New Testament text, is agios, is to be not of this world to be fundamentally different to the worldly and by implication to be heavenly. So, a human person is composed of, I don't know, cells and muscles and bones and various systems in the body. <laughs> However, something else. Man cannot be truly human without the Spirit of God as we see in Genesis 2.7. Man is body and soul and Holy Spirit, from St. Irenaeus, who is the one who said that um, the glory of God is man fully alive. Which he was referring to Christ. But this in turn can refer to us as we are in Christ. So we can choose two paths, as we mentioned earlier. We can choose life by grace and by the power of the Spirit, or we can choose death. But we are called to choose life. And not only this life, but the, a life of eternity. This is what we're called to. We're called to something much greater than what's going on here. The soul is created pure. Now, there's a practical application of this. If the soul is created pure, then what happens to those who died before they were able to be baptism? Able, able to be baptized, I should say. If the soul is created pure, then they're not treated as unbaptized. They're not treated as being, um, being damned or going to an intermediate place. None of that. The child is created of God, and so, so we know that to God, that child will return. So saying the soul is created pure seems 
seems a little theoretical until we really bring it back to back to our own practice. Yes, we baptize as soon as we're able. But if that's not possible, we know that that, that child will return to God. The passions are what corrupt this. And we're probably talking about something a little different than what most people talk about when they're saying I'm passionate about cricket or tennis or whatever the case may be. The passions um, are, are our wrongful desires. It's probably the shortest way of putting it. Or even correct desires done too much or too little. The passions corrupt this much like entropy corrupts a system. It's like a hospital. When, it, when, we, look at, um, when we look at sin, particularly a person's own sin, we usually use terminology that is medical. It's not, the, not that the juridical version of a justice system is necessarily wrong, but it can be misleading. So what we have instead is a hospital where people are suffering from passions and they need to get better. So sin is an illness and something. It's, it, it flares up and so it needs to be treated. It's also, um, just before we move on, worth noting the soul is received at the time of conception. It's not received at the quickening or at, at birth or anything along those lines. It's received at conception. And that has, that's going to have a lot of impacts when we discuss this further in ethics. Um, but conception is where the, the soul uh, is given. Ooh, our existential crisis. The philosophy student in me is loving this, loving this section. So the human need to be in community. We talked about this earlier. Uh, I mentioned there were a couple of words that were very helpful for us. To, um, we talked about this being the anthropology talk. Ology being the study of the anthropos. And it comes from two smaller words. To look up and contemplate. Theoria is where we get words like theory from, to think about if you have a theory, then you've thought about something. Here it's a bit, a little deeper again, to look up, to look up at the stars, to look up at the heavens, and to contemplate what there is beyond us. And this is the word for human. The word for human is the one who sees something bigger, or who looks for something bigger. And if we look at what humans do in societies all around the world, cultures all around the world, we find a yearning for something deeper, for something metaphysical, for something beyond the physical. And this is what it is to be human. There's another word there for person, for uh, prosopon. In Latin it became persona, which is slightly different. Um, but prosopon comes from, again, two small words, to look at, to look at the other. And so this is how we say people are people through other people because it requires another person to look upon us to make us person. We need both. We need both in our conception of ourselves to contemplate and to interact with others, to be truly human. These are all important parts. Hermits are both special and rare and what usually happens is that God will send people to them. <laughs> if you look at the lives of hermits, this comes up again and again, that their sanctity leads people to them. St. Mary of Egypt is probably the most famous example of a hermit who was there for years, decades. And even there, she had a chance encounter with, with a monk who was desperately trying to find a hermit um, who, who he imagined would be a Holy Spirit-bearing elder. And ended up being um, ended up being not nothing like what he expected. A woman who had no clothes because they were they had worn away in the sun after all of those years. And we read her life every year in Lent, so I won't spoil it here. Um, but it was nothing like he expected. Nothing like he expected. Um, 
So hermits are a special case. The rest of us, we need to look up, we need to look around. I'll just answer your question after the talk. Is that alright? Okay. Alright, hold on to it here. So, what it means to be human. We're the creatures of God and the pinnacle of creation. We also bear the image of God. Which is why it is that we, we should be excellent to one another. We should be our utmost and our best to one another. No matter how tarnished the icon that the other person is presenting, that's still an icon. We treat icons with respect. We ought to treat icons directly from God with at least the same respect. Christ was born and crucified and rose from the dead for our salvation. The whole course of his human life is, encaps is uh, included in that phrase, God became man. God took on human nature. God took on human life. All of it from conception to crucifixion to ascension. He took on all of it for us so that we might be made divine. By this we know that we're beloved of God. By this we know that each and every one of us are loved by God. And we know from this that God loved us too much to let us be apart from Him. And so He, he went through all of human life. He took, on the, he took on the human condition for us. And He made a way for us to return to God. And that's why the church exists. That's why it is that Jesus said to his lead apostle, Peter, on this rock, which is a pun, Peter meaning rock, on this Peter I will build my church. On this rock I will build my church. On the rock of your confession of faith, as the majority of fathers will, will affirm is the meaning of that. And the church exists to continue his desire that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's why we exist, so that all are saved. That's twofold. That means that all people and each one of us need to be saved. That's why our parish has two goals from the Great Commission, that um, to, bring, to, um, to hopefully bring everyone to a knowledge of orthodoxy and hopefully to become orthodox, and also to make our parishioners saints. That's the goals. And it's because of this. We have the image of God, we strive to grow into his likeness, and we do this together, along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So the goal, and the purpose, and the meaning of life, the meaning of human existence, all of this encapsulated, the meaning of life is to return to God. That's why theosis is such a big thing. The theosis is, there's going to be an entire talk about it in four weeks' time, so I won't spoil that thunder. But the short story is that theosis is our return to God. Theosis is how we are made at one with God. It fulfills God's will that all creation returns to Him. And it's how we become saints, how we become holy and of God. That's different from some other viewpoints. So, and I, I haven't made an, ex an exhaustive list either. So different religions do have commonalities with Christianity, and when we see them, we can celebrate this. Some are obvious. So Abrahamic religions, quote-unquote, uh, have a lot of similarities. Judaism and Islam have similarities to Christianity. Some, of course, are less obvious, coming from a cross-pollination of philosophical ideas. Um, some are not obvious at all. Like Irish paganism had a concept where deity was in three. You had a triple goddess idea um, of maiden, mother, and crone being the, being the concept of deity. Made it very, very easy when St. Patrick came along. <laughs> <laughs> that concept is, is quite foreign to most people. Um, but this three yet one was very familiar to the Irish pagans. St. Justin Martyr called this the locus spermaticos, which is the seeds of the word, which are scattered all throughout creation. Where people are trying to return to God, and so sometimes they derive good things through reason, 
is what he attributed to Greek philosophy, while um, other times it's um, a corruption of what they had received many centuries ago. Which is why you see a lot of similarities between old and traditional religions and Christianity. And it, what this represents is God's love for all people. Which means that either way, there are breadcrumbs leading us from where we were to Christ. So to contrast with a couple of other major metaphysical viewpoints, some viewpoints strive for nirvana or nothingness. Um, that this life is suffering, and the sooner it ends, eternally, the better. Some have the um, strive to maximize being remembered on earth, and put that as a meaning of life. What we strive for is different again. We strive for a return to God, to be, to use a modern expression, to be fully self-actualized, to be truly ourselves, is to return to God, to be reunited with the one from whom we came. And that's what theosis is about. It's not just getting a ticket to the most awesome eternity party ever, as a conception of heaven seems to be. It's not just getting out of fire, as conceptions of hell seem to be. It's a beautiful thing where we can return to God, where we can return to our Creator who loves us just like a good father loves children, loves his children. So, how do we go with these questions? We started a couple of minutes late, so I won't, I won't keep you too far, but how do we go with these questions? How were humans created? Dust. Dust. By God through dust. dust. Yeah. Uh, what were humans created in? Humans were created in the image, image and likeness. Image. Good. It, the image and likeness of God. What were we created for? Look after the Sorry. Look after the earth. Look after the earth. Yes. That's one correct answer. What? What are the others? Plants and seeds. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> to become like God. Yes. To grow into the likeness of God. Sorry, Carl, does that mean he, sorry, we were, were created to take care of the earth. Yep. Was the earth God's expression or us then, and we're here for the earth? I don't know if I'm making sense in my question, but... Both. So yeah. we're distinct from the earth. We're distinct from animals and plants. Yes, so, but I always understood... We're kind of caretakers of earth. Yeah. But we, uh, I've always thought of it as like we were the special ones in the earth is yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. But when you think of us being created as being stewards over the earth, it gives the earth a, a, a special quality that I hadn't quite thought of. Well, the, we're stewards on behalf of God. <clears throat> so we're not stewards on behalf of the earth to look after the earth. Okay. God entrusts us with looking after the earth. Okay. Yeah. Does that make more sense? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the earth isn't our boss. We, do, we also have dominion. Um, so you know, that's it goes humans then the creatures of the earth, but we're responsible to God for the the creatures because well who else is going to be? That's what we were created for. So is being sorry is then being a steward a reason for creation though, or is it just a after a byproduct of our creation more so? Because we were created, we therefore have to be a steward of the earth. We were created, and then we're told. Now look after Earth. Um, we don't part of our restriction is that we, we received a given amount of revelation. And so it's hard for me to answer your question as precisely as you're wanting. That's okay, I might not be asking it very well. But we, we are um, having, immediately after being created, we were told look after the Earth. So whether we were created in order to be guardians of the earth or whether we were created um, and we need a job to do, so you, know, you may as well do that one. Um, we haven't quite, I don't think we've got a specific enough revelation to properly, uh, conclusively answer that. Um, but it doesn't make a lot of practical difference either. We were created, we've got a command to look after the earth. Does that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. We're not the boss of the earth. No, no, no. Mm. just here is, yeah. 
We're not the boss because we don't have ownership. Yeah. Yeah. We're the representatives. God is the boss and we act on behalf of God. Yeah. Which makes life a lot harder. Middle management. <laughs> yeah, middle management. <laughs> middle management who needs to guess and interpret and understand God as well as possible. I know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think we were created uh, to realize our sinful nature and to achieve the theosis with God. Theosis is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So that that likeness with God, when Jesus came, it kind of multiplied it, and we can not only have likeness but also union. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's huge. <laughs> um, where was I? When does a human life begin? Conception. Good. Um, what does creation teach us about genders? You made them male and female. Yep. Just two. Yes. Only two. That's right. Uh, what did humans do to all creation in Genesis 3? Stuff it up. I guess that's probably the short answer. Isn't it? In response, in response, what did God promise to us? What did God prophesy? The heal the bruising of the heel and the head? Yes, the head of the snake and the, and the bruising of the heel of, of Christ. Mm. Good. So even then, Christ's coming was prophesied. Um, is humanity unique in creation? We've answered this, haven't we? So, yes. yes. Good. And how does the life of Christ change our relationship with God? God became man, so man might become God. So, St. Athanasius helped you out there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the entirety of the life of Christ, that is, too, is not just the incarnation. He's been incorrectly misunderstood for quite some time. That God became man means God was born, and therefore salvation was automatic. It's not. God became man and took on humanity, took on all of this human life, so that man might become, um, might be made God. Um, what is the purpose of a human life? To yes. do God's will. Yes. To do God's will, to return to God in a process called theosis. Or deification. Oh, we'll get into that next week. <laughs> um, what does theosis mean in a single sentence? Return to God. To become God. We're going to get a lot more detail uh, in our next session. We're, we've got an entire talk about what is this thing called theosis. But, um, and it is that important. But we, um, well, we shouldn't rush into this. That's sufficient for this, uh, for a one-sentence understanding of it. Now, I didn't include, I think I spoke about this last week, actually, um, that homework tasks, that I gave a homework task last week. For those preparing for baptism, it is uh, compulsory to submit this. Um, and to do so relatively soon, because otherwise you'll forget it. Like, the quicker you can, the better. After the 9th of December, once we've talked about um, what we believe and, and how, we, how we act, um, particularly our ethical statements, which I know can be shibboleths for people, and go, well, I accept your theology, but I don't accept how it, how it plays out. Um, fair enough. But the catechumenate is, um, is something that we'll leave until after ethics, because the catechumenate is a commitment. So if you're looking to be a catechumen, um, I'm looking, I'm thinking, as a goal, I'm looking for the week after the ninth, somewhere, somewhere during the week after the ninth. Um, I'd be very happy to do that on my name's day, actually, which is the 13th of December, but not everyone has a spare Thursday morning just for that. Um, so on the weekend as well. Um, but that's what um, I'm aiming for. Need the homework tasks. Um, and need to make sure that you've watched all of these talks as well as attending services or letting me know um, if, you're, if you can't do any one of those things. Uh, we have also started a, as well as our Bible study, every fortnight. We've, um, on the other Wednesday, we're doing a Vespers service. So 6.30 on Wednesdays, up until mid-December, will be something. It'll be Bible study this Wednesday, Vespers uh, next Wednesday, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you're needing something in the middle of the week, and I know that a number of people do, we had a lovely little um, Vespers service on the Wednesday just past. So um, so if that's something that you're, you're wanting or looking for, um, you're most welcome to come along to that as well. 
in four weeks' time, we'll be looking at salvation and theosis. And as I said, our reader, Ryan, will be delivering that talk. Um, he'll be talking about theosis and atonement and salvation, how that happened cosmically, and uh, how that happens in our own lives. It'll include things like Christ's redemption of humanity, what it is to have free will, um, being fellow workers with God, what are the first steps towards God in our reunion with Him, and what does it mean to live a transfigured life. So it's going to be a very big talk, um, which I'm really excited that he'll be able to deliver, being the patristics lecturer for our institute. And as always, we'll... Um, We'll close with prayer, and then in a couple of minutes, we'll have our question and answer session. You're most welcome to, to stay. Uh, you're most welcome to shoot through if you need to. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Greatly appreciated, uh, and I hope to see you in four weeks.